And Karen, thank you. <laughs> and Marcia. And Marcia, sorry, Marcia. <laughs> and I have somebody else who might be showing up. Um, it is so wonderful to see all of you. Um, some of you may know me from my past role as the director of the CSU Extension Office. I am a registered dietitian nutritionist. I spend a lot of time thinking about food safety, but right now I split my time between Steamboat Springs and sailing on a sailboat. And uh, which is currently back east while my husband got his rotator cuff fixed. <laughs> so what do I do? I say, oh yeah, I'll take that brownie troop on and Candace's daughter's in my brownie troop and yeah, I'll do root celery. I gotta be honest with you. I know nothing about root celery. Well, I take that back. I used to know nothing about root celery, but I'm very interested in food safety and I have come to understand a lot more about it. But I have some, some uh, people who have a little bit more first-hand knowledge about um, about root cellars and their use early years and uh, I have somebody who can speak to using a root cellar in the present time. Let me give you a few um, insights as to the recipes. What everybody told me is that they would go into the root cellar and they'd poke around and they'd see what needed to be eaten up and that dictated what they made. And uh, and no, they didn't use recipes. They just threw it all in a pot, put some meat, right? You know, um, so so there were no recipes that I could really draw from in the fair cookbook or from the people who said we didn't use recipes. So everybody said that they do maybe a pot pie or a stew so that a recipe for the stew, I trying to remember where I got it. I think I might have gotten it from uh, Cook's Illustrated or something like that. Everybody said that the carrots, they would make kind of a carrot salad. Oftentimes it would be just mixed with mayonnaise or something like that. This is a little bit of a facelift on a carrot salad. Um, uh, because I am a dietitian, I'm like, oh, a cup of mayonnaise? I think we could do better than that. And thank you for making it all you guys. And then roasted root vegetables, because in my kitchen, roasted root vegetables are the premium way I like to eat root vegetables. And the mixture that you have of root vegetables, I'm trying to remember what's in them. A lot of the traditional things we had, um, okay, my favorite, parsnips and carrots roasted together are so fabulous. Um, and the, the recipe that they made had turnips and parsnips and celery root and uh, and carrots. So some of those ingredients you may not have had in Rout County, celery root, no. Uh, I asked everybody about rutabagas, everybody said, yeah. You like rutabagas? I love I, I started looking at recipes and I'm like, you know, if nobody planted them because they didn't like them, I'm not gonna do a recipe for them. Um, my favorite, Beets, um, and and of course things like onions and things. These were all things that would be found in a root cellar mainly because they have a longer shelf life. Usually the moisture is a little bit less. The the density of the um, vegetable is is a little bit more dense, and so they last longer. So um, so the 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 bottom line on a root cellar is before refrigeration, you have to use what resources you have. And you can actually borrow the cold from the ground if you could dig down under the frost line, it's fairly consistently 52 degrees. And then you could bump up the cold by your ventilation, ventilation system, or opening you know, uh, a window or a door and then closing it. So once you've gotten that cold space, over the winter, a really good root cellar will remain a constant temperature all winter long. And depending on how cool it is, is depending on how long your vegetables will probably last. The ideal temperature in a root cellar is gonna be darn close to 40 to 37 to 40 degrees, really for chilling. Um, now most of these root cellars um, could have been dug in the side of a mountain or a hillside. Uh, they could have been dug into the ground. I know of people who had storm cellars 
like in Nebraska, and that's where they would store all their produce and canned goods and then have a place when the tornadoes hit. Um, spring houses, um, unfinished basements, uh, trenches dug in the garden and left, those can all have a function of making your vegetables last throughout the winter without additional um, refrigeration. The other things in a really well built, um, a really well built um, uh, root cellar would be some some humidity. So uh, a lot of times they would have like gravel floors, and on the gravel floors they could add water so that you know over time that moisture would build up and add moisture to the to the uh, root cellar. So um, there are a lot of techniques, and these guys can speak to a lot more of them than I can, but it really was the most natural way to use coldness to keep your vegetables over the winter when you didn't have refrigeration. And let's be honest, even when you did have refrigeration, other things probably took pri priority. Meat, dairy products, those kind of things. So the root cellar was a place to keep and store a lot of things for a long time over the winter. So with that, I'm going to let, yes? What's the nutritional value of vegetables that have been in the root cellar for like five months? Okay, so the longer a root cellar, or, or longer any vegetable is in storage, the fewer nutrients it has. Um, and you've probably heard that if you take certain vegetables, put them in your crisper and leave them for a couple of weeks, they have far less nutritional value than something that had been frozen or even canned. So um, fresh, you know, but if that's the only thing you have, then then that's probably worth watching. Um, but yes, any kind of uh, food preservation method, uh, including cold storage in a root cellar, over time the nutrients degrade, but they're still there. Okay? All right, so I'm going to turn it over to Marsha. Uh, Marsha Dockett. Yeah. Marsha's first. <laughs> Thanks, Karen. <sighs> Gosh, my pot. <laughs> I'm Marsha Dockenbach, and uh, I was, I'm now retired, but I was the Executive Director for Community Agriculture Alliance, so worked a lot with Karen on a number of project, projects and programs throughout the years. And of course, when she called and asked if I would help with this today, I was like, yes, thank you for asking me. Um, my experiences with root cellars are a while ago, because my folks used one. And um, my mother had a very small house that I currently live in. It's been added on a couple times. Um, but the, the house itself did not have a place for storage. Her kitchen was very small. And when I, and I look back on it now, and I think, how in the world did she put the meals out for all the hay crews, the, the combine crews, on a, a stove that was not much bigger than this, and then a little refrigerator. But the reason that they built a store, uh, cellar, they both came from Nebraska for one thing, and then they had that background. But um, they also needed the space. They needed all the uh, place to put all the canned goods. And so um, my dad built a very nice root cellar that has four steps down into it, uh, a dirt floor that we never used any extra water on in ours, but it's been it all over the years now it's just as hard as tile and then cement walls uh, with a overhang and you walk down into it and then um, there were shelving all the, on three of the four walls and the shelves were enough they were built with the right um, height so that you could store mostly cork, cork jars um, my mother used almost exclusively cork jars. It wasn't until later that she started even thinking about the pine jars. And again, it was because there were people to feed. And um, so that one was a great experience. I, I was never once scared to go down into that root cellar. It was clean, it was organized, it had electricity for lighting, so it was a great thing. Now my grandmothers on the other hand <laughs> scared the dickens out of me all the time. And it was down 
by the Elk River. Um, and they had just literally dug that down into the ground and, and poured cement steps to get into it. But then the, everything was so rickety. And I'm sure, I was thinking about this on my way into town, I'm just really sure that one reason that I was so scared was because I think my cousins told me they were rattlesnakes. <laughs> <laughs> Now, with the knowledge that I have now, down by the river, there were no rattlesnakes crawling around in there. But I always had that in the back of my head when she'd send me down to get something out of there. That I was going to be dead. They'd be counting me next. <laughs> and then after she passed away, and I had the responsibility of cleaning the, the ranch house and the sheds, including the, um, the, the cellar. Again, I was uh, the trepidation in my mind was much greater than it needed to be. But I got down in that cellar, and there were um, no one had lived in that house probably for 50 years. And here sat all these jars. Many of them were full. And I'm going to pass these around so that you can actually see the difference on them. Take a look at them. Look up and hold them up into the light because some of them are very seriously. Um, um, yeah, they're gridded, and they're different colors, so just pass them around and, and feel them. Um, these jars, the glass jars, were first used, uh, developed in Europe in the early 1800s, but they used wax seal, and um, they had and you can imagine, Aaron would be so pleased to know they were using a wax seal. They weren't very safe. Uh, they, couldn't, they didn't seal very well. And it wasn't until 1858 that a gentleman developed... Um, oh, God, let me back up just a second. Also, they had what was called a wire bale. Bale for some of them. Mm -hmm. And so play with these things yeah. if it goes by you as well. There's just a little catch on the lid. They use the wax again to try to keep it together. But you'll see how loose that is and how really unsafe it was for the food. So that was called a wire bale. And then in 1858, the mason jar was invented by Mr. Mason, John Mason, that's right. And with that, he developed the, uh, the screw rings on the side of the jars. And this one happens to be square. Linda just told me that they sold coffee of these, which I did not know. And he also developed these zinc lids. And as you, you're more than welcome to take those lids off of the, as you, they go around also. When they do, the inside the white, there's a white milk glass. And if you happen to find one that has clear glass, let me know. <laughs> uh, they're very unusual to have. Uh, do you have any with the clear? Yeah, of course you do. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the mason jar is the, the generic term, of course, the patented term for all of these. But then there's a number of them that came along that were the curve, curve the ball, uh, golden harvest, uh, the jardin. Atlas. Atlas, but they all go under the same because he had the original patent. <laughs> Most of these with the zinc jars came from my grandma. This is just a portion. There were there were probably a hundred down there, and I don't know what I'm going to do with them. And then we're talking about this stuff. <laughs> you know, there's, there's not much need. Uh, if you have them now, of course you're not. We probably should not use the zinc. Uh, Karen's going to talk more about the safety on that later. But um, they're great for storage things for decoration and things like that. So, so you're going to talk later about what's wrong with the zinc tops? No. I, I don't know. <laughs> I, you know, anything that touches food should really be um, up to date and designed for the house. So um, I would, I don't know exactly what would happen if you used the zinc lid, but I would only use it for things that are not There's a rubber seal that you can tell with, but I still would not want to use it. It's for decoration only. So that kind of concludes my little 
Park. And if you have any questions, I'd be glad to answer it now or we can wait till the end. Pam, can you um, talk about how, um, so I understand why you sure being down in the ground, but how they kept it dry. It seems like there would be a lot of heavy rain or runoff or anything that might get really wet all the time. The one down by the river was always damp. Uh, and it was because it did not have any cement walls it had it was more of just a hole in the ground the one that uh, at the place where I still live we are using it now I don't use it for uh, canning for food because I have more storage space within the house and don't need it but we use it for paints and for chemicals to keep them at a constant temperature uh, and they do stay dry because of the cement walls and then they overhang a good roof on them as well and we very seldom have moisture down here likewise very seldom have uh, mice or any uh, thing I, I would add that ventilation is a really important part of a, of a really good root cellar system and because you don't want condensation forming inside but you do want moisture it should be around 90 to 95 percent of humidity um, in the uh, ideal scenario for the longest um, longevity and, of your, your vegetables because the vegetables will start to shrivel if it gets too dry in there uh, so there are lots of ways you can maintain the moisture but ventilation helps you um, clear out some of the moisture if you need to. And then how long could you keep roots in there? I feel like in the refrigerator and a crisper, you know, carrots can go a pretty long time, but then potatoes, you know, in the cabinet in a cool place are getting eyes. I think Linda had grew up doing a variety of things to make it longer. But I think it totally depends on what kind of a root cellar you have. Um, for instance, some of the things I read said you have to take everything off the floor so that there's air circulating underneath. But yet there are some that are actually too big to take off the floor. Then you need to rotate your crops. And there are a variety of things that you do to the produce in your root cellar that make it last longer or shorten the life. Some of it has to do with temperature. Some of it has to do with moisture. Some of it has to do with ventilation. Um, so, because technically you could have a root cellar type experience in your unfinished part of your basement or even in your garage. All of those are going to have your produce lasting a lot shorter time than that, that premium, premium ideal circumstance of, you know, really 37 to 41 degree, 90 to 95% humidity kind of thing. So. Um, it, I guess the answer is it really depends. And I might add too that we have gotten very picky about what we eat. And the old timers, they used up every bit of that food. They didn't let anything go to waste. And granted, some of those potatoes were probably pretty shriveled and the carrots were a little limp. But they didn't have the option of throwing them out. And so we, but we're much more spoiled now and have that capability. Um, and then, uh, are there, I'll let, Long. <laughs> so Linda Long is really our expert. Yes, sir. Um, so uh, the, the idea behind canning, <clears throat> I didn't realize that it needed to be um, kept cold, and that was my first question. If you could say a little bit about that. And the second one, what is the shelf life for, um, or does it vary depending upon the, the, the product? I'll let Linda answer both of those, but I will tell you that yeah. when I walked into that cellar of my grandparents, there were still jars of canned meat in there that probably were as good that day as they had been when she canned them. Yeah. I didn't open those up because I was afraid they would probably at that point go kaboom, and I certainly wasn't going to eat them. Well, that's a sign that they're probably not going to eat. Yeah. I will say one thing about the length of time. Um, the recommendation is one year for a canned good, maybe two. A lot of us have left them a little bit longer, but the recommendation is one to two years for your canned goods. And it doesn't have to be cold. The beauty of a canned good is that it can be stored at room temperature. What you don't want is warmth or frozen and light. And so light. you want to put it in a dark, cool, place but it does not have to be as cold as a root cellar would be but it's just that's where the space was that's where the food okay. in the pantry was 
I'm Linda Long. I'm a, I don't have any special titles, but <laughs> I'm just a, a rancher's wife and I come from South Route. I come from the Deer Park and so um, we just kind of live the life that everybody is wanting to go back to now. Um, <laughs> why a lot of it is but anyway so uh, we lived on a ranch we lived with my folks up in a, a adjoining ranch to my grandparents and my uncle was adjoining to that one so we had like three families that lived uh, and worked together played together did all that together so um, it's just uh, our cellar was in the basement under it really wasn't a basement it was just dug out underneath the house and it was always dry we didn't want any moisture in ours never did have it in there so um, I think it's probably the preferences you know and probably the newer um, advice that they're giving out now is you want to have that humidity and all that kind of stuff we didn't have it we didn't need it you know I mean we kept all of our vegetables so um, I'm going to kind of like tell you like it was when I was a kid growing up. It's from a, uh, a softer, kinder, and gentler time. Uh, but you begin planning your head right now you, uh, uh, to fill the root cellar. You didn't start in August. You started in February, January, February. Uh, after looking at the Christmas wish book, Mm -hmm. The monkey ward is what we called them instead of Montgomery Ward. <laughs> and here's the robot cards or catalogs that we had wore out by the time that this came along. Uh, the family started looking forward to the, to the seed catalogs that started in the mailboxes in January. There was the Gurney, the Burpee, the Ferris Moore, uh, Spring Hill, and that's just to name a few of those the seed catalogs that came. We spent hours dreaming and looking at the pictures, wishing that that <laughs> never change. <laughs> yes. Right, they never change it even today. Um, when the order was placed though, however, in February, they were all the same as last year's. <laughs> For a tried and fruit, uh, true, they were the lettuce from the iceberg lettuce, uh, yes. and I have some samples of all different ones here. Uh, they were the iceberg lettuce, the stonehead cabbage, uh, because it was good for sauerkraut, the Detroit beets, because they canned well, uh, the red potatoes and the white potatoes, because they were good keepers, uh, the Bloomingdale spinach, because it always had uh, strong leaves for canning and etc., because you couldn't keep it otherwise, purple top uh, turnips, because they was always pretty I and mean, they always kept well, uh, the little marble peas, because they canned well. So those were all the reasons that we had, we couldn't change from one year to the next because these were tried and true. We didn't have the money to put out for extra uh, seeds that we couldn't use. And we only had about 45 days in our area to really grow a garden. So you didn't mess around. You, you knew that you needed that food, so you took what you had. So um, uh, we would, always plant by the almanac. I got a sample of one in here. Um, and we, we usually never planted our garden until after Labor Day, or I mean Memorial Day. So you said 45 days to, to get the garden going. That means to get the seeds in the ground? No, 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 well, it was basically a root garden, you know, I mean, but, but our lettuces, the, le the leaf lettuce, the spinach, and all of those, it was 45 days. Mm. So, like I said, we didn't play around with the seed catalogs. We got what we knew would work, and that's what we went with. Wow. So, it was always disappointing when Mom would send this order out and it hadn't changed yet. <laughs> <laughs> it was the same. Um, the... Uh, Potatoes, carrots, turnips, etc., was never dug up until after the first frost, and that because that set their skins. <coughs> Dad built a wire table that we used out in the yard, and it was made out of chick wire, not chicken wire, that had the round holes. These were the little tiny square ones, like so, and we called it chick wire. And um, we washed 
dad had built, he was a very handy carpenter. We had lots of sawmills around us, and so the lumber was plentiful. And so we would, he would build these tables that we could uh, wash all the vegetables on. And then we would lay a sheet over the top of those and we'd let them dry, really get them dry. And um, then all of the potatoes and those kind of things were stored in two gunny sacks and the carrots and the turnips and the parsnips were stored in sand bins that would have been a lot like this one, but they would have had a lining of, of screen in there to hold the sand. And then we would have buried the, all the carrots and, and things like that into that sand. And that keeps them pretty solid for till about March. And um, so we, we, carry, we put our, um, all of our carrots, turnips, parsnips, those kind of root vegetables into those. The potatoes was always in a gunny sack. Um, the onions would come in a gunny sack. We left them in there. Uh, so most of everything else was in gunny sacks. Um, Did you wash and reuse those? The gunny sacks, yeah. We never threw anything away. Um, this is also where us kids learned how to make mud pies. We thought that was really great. And because we'd use that dirt, you know, off of the potatoes and the carrots and things like that. So it was really fine, fine mud. Yes, guys, I have <laughs> The garden was watered by a pipe stuck in the spring box. And it was carried in buckets if we couldn't get it to an area, you know, if we needed a little extra water, like onto the cauliflower or onto the cabbages or something like that, we would carry those into buckets. Uh, the potato field was at the end of our mesa, at the end of the hay field. It was irrigated with the water left <coughs> over from the hay fields. So when, when the water was running back down off of the hill and back into the creek, we used that water to run, do our potato field. So that's how we got our potatoes, and it was in a field of its own. Um, my dad built a slip that we would have with well, the horses would pull on, and I never ever understood as a kid how rocks could grow every year. <laughs> but we would get rocks every spring, and the next spring it was to do all over again. So I never did understand how the rocks could grow, but they did. Um, <laughs> um, we wrapped our head lettuce, our tomatoes that we would get from Grand Junction and by a peddler would come in, and our cabbage. And we would try to keep it until Thanksgiving. And it probably wasn't something that today anybody would went and buy, but we thought it was just really, really tasty and really nice that if we had it on Thanksgiving Day dinner, that we would have some leftover lettuce and tomatoes and those kind of things. So we would stretch it as far as we could, but again, it wasn't something that you just went out and bought because we didn't have the means to go buy it and we didn't have any place to buy it if we had it. So, um, and then by March, uh, like beginning this next month, um, anything that was left over in the cellar, like the carrots, some of the potatoes, we kept going through them. We, we would rotate the crop all the time. And if anything was rotten or anything like that, that went into the pig's bucket. The rest of it, we figured out a way to use it. We would start making the stews. We would start making pot pies. We would start making, you know, all of these kind of things. My mom would make and my grandmother would make tons of homemade soup and then we would can that soup. And it was really handy when we went to hunting camp. It was really handy when we was in the hay field to have all those extra things done. So we um, started in March and we started putting anything that was left over even you know we'd start with the apples and we'd make applesauce we would dry the apples we would you know do all that but up until then we would have the fresh apple we could go down and it just tasted so good to have a solid apple so those kind of things we would do but then afterwards then it became applesauce it became dried apples or it became an apple pie or any of that kind of stuff so my i i was very lucky i came from great cooks they uh were able to make anything taste good out of, you know, my dad used to say he could, my mom could make a food leather taste good. So I, I don't think we ever tried that. <laughs> but anyway, the, the root cellar was our lifeline. So um, it was something that we, that we just had to, uh, that was how we lived. If we didn't have that, we would have not had any groceries for our families. And 
we used to can like 50 bushels of peaches when this competitor would come and we would have them on the shelves in quart jars and sometimes in a pint and a half, or a quart and a half jars that was the half gallons and we would have those on our shelves you know and everything like that so uh, several years ago i wrote this little story so i'm going to read it to you real quickly here today and just to kind of get the feel of, of you know what how important the book seller was to us so uh, this is, I, I, I labeled it, what you would see from my back porch. It's where you would be welcomed with a hearty handshake and a warm hug. It's an extension of the large kitchen. And when I was growing up, we had no running water or electricity. So this was about the time, in that time period. We never felt a hardship as we didn't have, know of any other way. And all of our neighbors lived the same. So we didn't think it was anything different. Uh, when you walked through the door, you would probably find fresh baked bread, cinnamon rolls, or maybe a pie cooling on the counter. You would see linoleum covering the floor, countertops, and, and the linoleum would cover our countertops. That way we could keep everything clean. You would see the cream separator standing with clean jars waiting to be filled with fresh milk. A wire basket with fresh eggs gathered this morning. And then they, I put the parentheses, the eggs after the family needs would be taken into town and would be um, traded for other needs. So we would, it would be uh, written down for credit until enough was made to purchase the material or the fabric that we needed or whatever else that my mom was wanting to, to save for. The cream was put into cream cans and would be shipped on the train going to Denver. These ch checks would be to buy our shoes or the winter coats for the winter, mm -hmm. and nothing extravagant. Maybe even the garden seat we might be able to use some of that money towards the garden seats that we would order. And when the garden seats came, they would come in ounces, not in these packages. They would come in an ounce. You'd have them in a paper bag, and you'd just they'd be wrapped in string. That's how we would buy them. And a lot of times, like Montgomery's General Store, the people's uh, general store in Taconis, uh, all of those would sell the garden seeds because they would order them in bulk. So we would get up some of our seeds from there, but most of them we ordered. Um, in the middle of the room is a large rag rug, handmade by my grandmother and, and my mom, and even us kids had a part in helping. And nearby was a washboard hanging on the wall, uh, a ringer wash machine, gas ran, uh, with two large tubs. Wash day was done on Mondays, and it took the whole family to haul in the water from the spring and to haul it out when done. By the, by the door is a large wooden box with sections in it holding kindling for the cook stove, logs for the pot belly stove, and lump coal. Uh, for washing hands, there would be a small wash pan with homemade soap next to it. Next to the separator, there would be buckets for milking and water for all si of all sizes that fit the hands of all sizes. When you started walking, your hands just happened to fit that bucket. <laughs> In the left corner was a trap door. When you lifted that door, going down the stairs, you see the shelves lined with linoleum for easy cleaning, the jars of all the canned fruits, vegetables, meats, and fish jams and jellies, and there was always a, can, a gallon jar of jelly beans or another one of gumdrops. Gunny sacks, bushel baskets would be on the floor filled with potatoes, onions, cabbage, squash, and pumpkins. A large bin filled with sand held the, the carrots, the turnips, and the parsnips. My dad, like I said, was pretty handy as a carpenter, and what he did to keep everything up off the floor is that we had a um, he would take two by fours and lay them pretty close together, set a screen over the top of them, and that's where we set all of our vegetables on so they didn't set on the floors. And that's how the ventilation helped. So that's how we did ours. Um, we um, had the bushel baskets would be on the floor filled with the potatoes, the onions, the cabbage, the squashes, the onions. A large bin filled the sand, with, filled with the sand, held the carrots and um, 
the turnips and the parsnips, the barrels of flour and sugar. This was our grocery store, as you didn't go through to, go to town that often. So these provisions had to last the family through the winter, but through the spring and most of the summer too, because there was no lettuce, there was no, until it's come out of the gardens, there was none of that kind of stuff. So we had to make all that stuff stretch. So we had to make, like she said, uh, Marcia said, we didn't throw shriveled carrots away. We figured out how to use them. We didn't throw shriveled potatoes away. We had to use them. So um, all of that kind of stuff, because we just didn't have a lot of, uh, we just didn't have a lot of waste. But my mom and my grandmother were very <coughs> capable and very smart about how to preserve everything. And they, uh, I learned how to cook. I had a job when I was three years old washing jars. And so everybody in the family had a job to do, and we all learned how to can and how to preserve all of our food. Uh, so I guess I was very lucky. Um, um, there would be um, the fresh fruits and those kind of things held better, like the apples and that kind of stuff. But then by March, we was making the apple sauces and we were making <coughs> apple butter and we were making <coughs> apple pies and those kind of things that we could make up. So the jar, and we had jerky that we'd make from the meat, um, whatever we didn't can. Um, so, we, and that was also sitting on the shelves. We would usually only go to the cellar on Saturdays. Uh, the week supply would be brought up, and because the light is also probably the most damaging thing in the cellar that you can have, is if you have a lot of light. We only had some coil oil lamps that we lit to a couple of them, I remember. And, but light is what is the biggest damage in the cellar, and that's what starts your food to deteriorate. It's also what doesn't hold very well. So your light is, is your, your biggest problem. So we never was able to go down and just leave the lights on or anything like that. We had a purpose when we went down there and we did our purpose and we got out of there. So the week supplies would be brought up and remember those gumdrops and those jelly beans? <laughs> we would all get two each. And we so look forward to having that. So we'd have two, two jelly beans and two gumdrops. We thought that was really special. So, um, just beyond the trap door, you would step through another door. This was our screen porch. It had about four foot walls built to keep the snow out, surrounded by the screen. Shutters were on the outside, and it was insulated with about eight inches of sawdust. Okay. And because we could, again, we had sawmills everywhere, and so we, um, and my dad being the carpenter that he was, if he got two by eight, then we'd have eight inches of sawdust that we would pack down into that with insulation. Then with the snow like the winter we're having now, it was pretty warm in there. It really wasn't that bad, but it was cool enough to keep all of our food. So, but that's how we would do that. Um, there was uh, a large box that my dad, wooden box that my dad built in the corner. Uh, it would be filled with large blocks of ice and covered with sawdust. Mm -hmm. It had shelves built to hold the fresh milk, the cream, butter, and the eggs. The back of this room was used for hanging fresh meat. The tools found in this room was a large cutting board, large homemade knives, a meat cleaver, and a meat handsaw. All would be used daily to cut the meat for dinner. There was also an ice pick for chipping off some ice when needed. There was plenty of sawmills all around on Green Ridge, Flat, uh, Five Pine Mesa, and Tacoma's. Um, so the sawdust was readily available, so then we used it that way. But we never did put it down in our basement because it always would give you, um, you couldn't put it with the vegetables because the vegetables would pick up that, that smell of the sawdust. So the sand, the dirt, that's all we used. So, um, and it was always dry. <laughs> Uh, the men would use the teams in the winter to cut ice from a, from a pond about a mile from our house. The company paid for the use of the teams and for the labor of the men to cut the ice and to drag it into the storage for lettuce and spinach fields. So we always had ice. Uh, we were probably lucky, but hardworking people. Uh, so we had usually plenty of food and enough to barter with all of our neighbors. And that's what we ended up doing a lot of it back in the day. If we had extra potatoes, 
and the farmer next to us needed a piece of uh, some hogs or something like that or or anything we would barter with all of the neighbors uh, we had bachelors that lived nearby that would come and they would have maybe something that they would if you'll make me some homemade bread i'll do this for you you know so there was always a lot of bartering going on with our neighbors so we took care of each other that's the kind of the way that we had to live in our in our area so um, anyway that's what i wrote about the memories of the back porch so um, do you have any questions yes when did you start planting and how large was your garden we had a very large garden because it had to serve three families um, we never started we never planted our garden because I we lived higher in the mountains and it's um, so we never ever even thought about planting the garden until Labor Day weekend and then, or our Memorial Day weekend and then um, we would have it um, usually the first frost the last frost in the Yampa area is usually around the 21st of June and then the last frost or the first frost afterwards would be usually by Labor Day weekend it would be frosting on this and so we only had about a 45 day period there so uh, we would start it we had a sun porch we would start the cabbage we would start some of the of, of those kind of vegetables we would start in the coffee cans on the sun porch but it really wasn't heated so they didn't do really well <laughs> And we had no lights, you know, or anything like that to hang over like they do today. So uh, I don't recall that that was, I mean, the cabbage survived, but I can't remember that we really did a great job in doing it that way. So, but we never planted a garden, and I still don't today plant my garden before Memorial Day because it just gets frosted. So, anybody else? When was your ranch established? I mean, when did your people? About 131 years ago. Oh a long time. Did you use crocs to make sauerkraut? Actually we did. In the basement we would have a crock with pickles and we would have a crock with sauerkraut. And I now put all my pickles in jars and do them and I do the sauerkraut also in the jars. But at the time we did have crocs in the basement that had the, crock, the sauerkraut and the pickles as well. We had in those. Any fertilizer? What did you use for fertilizer? Um, the chickens, <laughs> the sheep, and the cattle. Real organic. They're real organic. We never had any, we never had anything purchased you know, like that. We just didn't have, have the means to get it anyway. You know. So we had a manure spreader. We used that. And that's what we used. So, and it was a very good garden. Did you um, change your area of what you planted? Like rotating the crops? Yeah. Sure. Um, we would plant the garden you know starting here and you know go one way this way the next year we would reverse it and come back and then the next time we would go the other way we would you know uh, so yeah we rotated the crops a lot and the potatoes we tried to keep the different seeds we had a, a lot of potato growers in our area some of them had some certified seed we generally didn't do that because we didn't want to get scabs and those kind of things into our potatoes. So we got the certified seed usually from areas is where we get our seeds from. And they were a seed catalog. And so we'd get our potato seeds from there. And we didn't have russets. We didn't have, the, it was a red potato and a white potato. <laughs> <laughs> My folks didn't, didn't very, very far from, from from what we had, you know. So, um, like I said, we would sit there and dream about all these beautiful things that was grown in this in this catalog. And then when we ordered, it was the same one. <laughs> and you said, well, you use your root cellar? Okay, I, I have moved from that ranch, okay. and I live now in Oak Creek, so I, I moved all of 17 miles of my life. It's been a real adventure <laughs> <laughs> to, to Oak Creek, and so in 1970, I built a root cellar, and mine, this one here, was underneath the house, and so it was always a constant temperature. I don't remember, to be honest, what the temperature was in the one in the, under the house. But it was always cool when we went down there, so I suppose it was in the 40s, you know, something in that. And so I built one, and I built mine out of the side of the hill. And we used timbers, 
from the sawmill and we lined all of ours in the timber and then I put tar paper on the inside of it and that sealed it and uh, we had a dirt floor in it I had the cribs built just like my dad had done in ours uh, growing up and it's still usable I'm not there I'm only one person now <coughs> Why do I need to go to the cellar? So I just kind of keep everything in the in the basement of the house I'm currently living in. So I have storage in there, and I can keep my canned goods, and 300 pounds of potatoes, and all that kind of stuff down there. And I don't have to do it, you know. And I don't have to go out and shovel it all the way to the. To the How much do you put up in cans over here? Um, oh, still now. You stars. <laughs> oh, probably a couple hundred. I don't know. I do a lot. And her family still relies on her home can. <laughs> they all come into the to the pantry, and I, Grandma, I need tomatoes, I need peaches, and they take a case out of it. I probably go to. I probably did post, uh, seventy cases of jars this year. And Karen She's the energizer bunny. Yeah. Of food preservation. Karen knows how I don't. I'm, I'm just like my parents. I stay with the tried and true. I have the nanties, I have the iceberg lettuce, I have uh, the Bloomingdale uh, spinach, you know, so I'm still doing exactly what my parents did. <laughs> Karen and I went to Grand Junction. I had to go get I, Alberta peaches. I have a change. I will tell you it is such a treat to drive to Grand Junction because you walk into all of these long-standing farm stands, family run, and it's just old home week. <laughs> Linda! <laughs> it was fun. I have, I, I have one more person that I would hope is willing to talk a little bit. When I was asking Linda and, and Marsha about their experiences with a, with a root cellar, I said, well, now, isn't there anybody who still uses a root cellar? And Penny. Do you want to, uh, now you're kind of by the camera there, would you mind coming up here? Just, okay, so let me just tell you, Penny Turan, and this is her, your daughter? Yes, I'm Lisa. Oh, Lisa, yes. okay, come on up. So, I went through the grapevine and found this a one. A long grapevine. A long grapevine, <laughs> because really, you are one in a million. But she uses hers daily. And I, I, can you just describe why you wanted, in this day and age, why you wanted a root cellar, what you had to do to get your husband to build it for you. <laughs> and then while you're doing that, I'm gonna just take, she gave me some pictures. Uh, and I'm just gonna pass them around so you can get an idea what, what a today type of um, uh, root cellar looks like. So do you mind? Just, That's just, fine, thank okay. you. <laughs> Like Linda, I was raised on a ranch, and we had my great-grandmother under her house in Milner. Um, it wasn't a root cellar. It was just this room under the house that was scary. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> and the one thing I remember under the great-grandma's house was she grew dandelions under the house because that's the only thing they had at that time. So she put dandelions down and she she would put a board over them and lift up the board and there were these beautiful white dandelions. <laughs> and that was one memory. Well then in my my house, underneath the house was a cellar. And my grandma always used it and then my mom used it. And I always I I just always wanted a cellar. Where we live now I couldn't have a cellar. I didn't think I could have a cellar. We didn't have one. And I was storing all of my canned food in boxes in a closet in my house and i really got tired of that so i told my husband i said if you could just figure out a way to build me a cellar i said i'd fill it <laughs> and he and my neighbor came up with a cellar idea that was it was phenomenal because we don't have a hill that we could dig into for a cellar so we built our cellar out of those cinder blocks they take the left what's left in a cement truck when they pour cement there's a little bit left all the time so they pour these 12 foot, 12 by 6 foot cinder blocks. They use them for barriers and whatever. We use those, we got those, and we built our cellar. And it's um, 12 feet wide, and it's 18 feet long. Oh my God. And so in the front, 
<laughs> Wait, you see these pictures? <laughs> we took five feet of that and made a little, I call it an ante room. I knew I needed a room to hold the, the heat and the cold and everything. And we built that and then my husband built shelves along the sides for me and we put peat gravel on the floor and he put a vent system in because that's one of the really important things that we learned is your ventilation. And he put a vent system in and to control the humidity, if it gets too low on humidity, the peat gravel's on the floor because then we just pour buckets of water on the floor. Oh. And it keeps our humidity level between the How do you and measure your humidity? If you get a, an, if you get a thermometer, and you'll see in the pictures there's a thermometer, underneath the temperature there's a hydro, hydrometer, and it shows the humidity level. And what do you aim for? Between 80 and 90. And then your ventilation, you want good ventilation because it keeps from the moisture, you know, you, you don't get the condensation because you don't want it too, too moist. And so he's got a vent in the top that goes out the top, and then he built a ventilation system out the front, and it goes out the front the bottom. And so we have really good ventilation. Sometimes the temperature, yes. Just a quick question, do I see um, raw chicken canned in there? It's canned, so it, yeah, it's... So did you, do you have t chickens and then you wanted to... Uh, can you yeah. just tell me about like the, pro so the process, or do you buy them and then instead of freezing them, you can them or what we kind of... raise them. Okay. And I, when we um, get ready to rotate our old hens, I can the old hens. Okay. Mm -hmm. Old hens are very popular for your soups yeah. and things of that nature, and so it's a less of a waste, yeah. you know, instead of just tossing them in the, it makes your best soups, your bone broth soup, that kind of stuff that is so popular now mm -hmm. has always been. And so, yeah, so we're not wasting our old hens. They're not the best to fry up and eat, but to can it makes it very tender, very flavorful, very good. And that would be done in a pressure can. Yes. And what about all the corn? Are, do you grow corn? We have grown corn, and we do grow corn, and I do can the corn. Yes. But it's not always, it's not one of those tried and true tr crops for this area. It's, it's, we play with that a lot. In some years we don't get, but some yeah. years we do. And so... Where do you live? We live in Haiti. In Haiti. Yes, ma'am. Do you still get together for hog butchering day? To get together for what? Hog butchering day. Do all that? <laughs> or is that a thing? We don't anymore. Okay. But we used, yeah, we used to have a big hog butchering. Mm -hmm. yeah. Their family. She used to live in Milner. If there's ever a zombie apocalypse, <laughs> I'm going to drive, I'm going to run one mile and live with the Cavalettis. <laughs> they are the true, you have a true pioneer shop. Well, and we and started started that that we had the separator on the porch and the, the jars ready for the milk and right. the, everything. It's just, it was just like, it was, it was like my house when you, you were talking it. about it. Yeah. <laughs> it's so hard. yeah. So I just, I've always been really interested in all of that, and I'm so fortunate my daughter is really interested in it. So we're doing all this together. And it's good in my son, so we want to keep this this part alive. And, you know, this, this we want to keep it going. We want to teach our children, you know, and I want to teach my, ch my children, and we work really hard to keep this all going. We grow our vegetables as well, like Linda was saying. You know, we never really vary. I play a little bit more with seed stuff, but our big garden is the same. Try and true. <laughs> Try and true because it's it's fickle here. It's hard growing a garden, and it's and we I go shopping all the time, and I our our carrots, our potatoes, our squashes. Squashes wasn't mentioned much, but squashes of varieties. In our area, we never had. Yeah, you could maybe do that up there, um, but. Mom, mom stuff in her cellar will stay. We're still crispy carrots, great looking potatoes, um, still very, very, we shop all the onions, the garlic, 
So we might not have the pig butchering anymore, but you ought to be at our house now when we can pickles. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do you have cucumbers and stuff? We do cucumbers and we have, I get the boys and Lisa and the family and my son and we, we have pickle canning, dill pickles. Oh, dill pickles. Right. So, so, so yeah, we, it's a lot, it's very gratifying and I love it and I'm very passionate about it. And if any of you are interested in a garden, a great book is Root Celery by Mike and Nancy, and it's B-U-B-E-L. And that's the, the book. <laughs> that's the book that Joe and I used. And we, is it? We studied that book, minute, just Building Our back. Cellar. And we still go back to it for a refresher once in a while. That is the extension office's copy. Great, great so eventually book. it'll be back there. If you were interested, you could uh, check it out. Yeah, it's a great book. It's really good. It tells you in there all about the ventilation in your new cellars. The old cellars, they didn't worry too much about ventilation. They didn't know anything about it. Right, exactly. I know our cellar at the ranch there, and it has since caved in. There was a vent on the top of it. Uh, there was the one in the hill yes. has its vent, yes. and it has a double door on it. Yes. So you could go in, shut that door, yes. and then you go on into it so you didn't get the cold, cold, cold air yeah. into it. So we had the double door, we had the venting. Yes. Uh, we never had it, but I kept it dry. I never, I didn't exactly. want the humidity. Right. I didn't yeah. want my jars rusting, and I didn't want uh, the mold smell. And that's the one thing that I have learned. Um, I don't anymore in my cellar. I don't keep my rings on my jars because it rusts because of the rusting, because of the humidity. I have to have the humidity higher because we have a lot of potatoes in there. And I have my carrots, and I have my beets, and like the squashes and stuff. I need that humidity. So I just take the rings off of my jars. So I don't have that. Sorry. Well, have you have a failed lid, yeah, if, if you have a failed lid, it's more obvious if the ring is off. Right. right. Okay. Right. Um, but uh, I've heard every canner does it a little bit differently. I, I will say that I have had so much fun learning about root cellars. And I'll tell you my takeaways for today. I used to, for me, I can when I've gone down to Palisade or I've just harvested for my garden. That's when I can. You guys are doing the canning now well, you have with to. all of the things that you, you didn't have time to. Not just the time, but like your carrots. I'm, I'm going to start canning carrots here right away because I, they're going to start getting soft. And you don't want to can them after they're soft. No. Yeah. And you have to use them right away. But you've been eating them fresh while the rest of us have been paying, I don't even know how much when we go out to the grocery store. You've been eating fresh from your garden all winter long. And that's super important to us as a family. Like we want it. That's what's another reason we've done this is so that we are eating fresh and we, we know what's in there. There's no preservatives. That's right. That's right. That's right. <coughs> well, I, I just, yeah. So I just had a question. What, I noticed coolers in the pictures. What do you use the coolers for? That's where my carrots are. Oh, inside? And inside the coolers, layered in sand. Oh. And I, I find that it's better for myself and for what we're doing in the coolers because I can control that humidity even more. Because when that sand starts drying out, because the carrots will absorb the moisture and the, they'll start drying out and they get rubbery. So I go ahead and put some water in there and then shut the lids and I can control the, the, the moisture in the sand better. And I do the same thing with beets. You can do beets too. I'm going to be canning beets for you. I never can any. I mean, we immediately canned our beets because they didn't hold very well in the sand. They do in the sand. They do. Well, we like to put them in the sand, but we, we'd end up doing it by Thanksgiving. We'd probably Okay. Get ready by then. Okay. Well, we Thanksgiving was our our trigger. After we went, had dinner for Thanksgiving, then we really got busy then about taking care of it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you guys. I I um, like I said, I have learned a lot. I will say one other thing, just because I watched the news this morning and they were talking about the coronavirus, and and I think to myself, you know. We are sitting here in a history museum thinking that these are techniques that are, are long gone. And in many ways they are. But think about it for a second. You know, maybe your garage could be a place where you could 
you know, use an old cooler and keep some of your produce and have maybe not a root cellar is as, as expansive as what Penny and, and Linda are talking about, but there are some techniques for using the natural cold that we have here in Route County. Um, I went to a climate change talk at CMC several weeks ago. You know the number one use of energy? Refrigeration. So these techniques, uh, time to think about them again. And thank you very much, everybody, for, uh, for contributing. So.